USS Vesuvius was a small experimental American cruiser designed almost entirely to take advantage of and be the test bed for the newly developed dynamite gun. What is a dynamite gun, you might ask? Well, let's briefly explain the reason for the dynamite gun being in existence in the first place. You see, the problem was, towards the end of the 1800s, people had been very, very inventive, and they'd come up with all sorts of interesting high explosives. The only problem was that every time you tried to put one of these high explosives into some kind of naval shell to increase your firepower, it turned out that with the kind of explosive charges that propelled the shells, you had a mild problem. You see, the charges tended to give the shells a bit of a kick rather than a shove out of the gun barrel, and it turned out that early high explosives were very temperamental and unstable. So if you gave them a sudden massive kick, like, say, have, after having stuffed them down the barrel of a gun and put a massive charge behind it, it turned out that you hadn't actually invented a more powerful naval gun, you had in fact invented a very large and very expensive pipe bomb. Yay! Needless to say, most navies were not keen on their ships self-destructing the instant they tried to engage the enemy. And so, a great many experiments were conducted in order to try and find a solution. These would eventually bear fruit in such explosives as cordite, which technically didn't explode, it more burned very rapidly. Which is actually an important distinction, because by burning or deflagrating rapidly, it produced an expansion of gas which helped shove shells out of the barrel, as opposed to a near-instant detonation, which was the problem in the first place. But that was for the future. The dynamite gun came about as a result of one of those experiments. Since the US Navy at the time had, in the words of historian Francis J. Allen, gotten into such a state of disrepair that for all intents and purposes it had ceased being an instrument of national policy or defence, the US Navy was quite keen to test out any weapon it could use to try and get a bit of an edge up on its rivals as it started to build its naval forces back up again. And so William Cramp and Sons would lay down the hull of the 930-ton Vesuvius in 1887, launch it in 1888, and it would be commissioned in 1890, which was pretty quick. But then again, at just under 250 foot long, it wasn't exactly the world's largest ship. With their engines producing a grand total of just under 4,500 horsepower, using vertical triple expansion technology, she was able to make 21 knots on two screws. Built more along the lines of a pleasure yacht, and with a turning radius that would make the CSS Virginia do a double take, the Vesuvius was not perhaps the world's most heavily protected warship, given that by and large its armour consisted mostly of hopes and prayers. But as we mentioned at the outset, it was mainly designed as a test bed, not a full-scale warship, the idea being that if the guns proved successful, a much larger vessel would be designed. Upon her commissioning, she was listed as carrying three 15-inch pneumatic dynamite guns, two 3-pounder cannon, two revolver 37mm cannon, and a pair of Gatling guns. Upon her launch, there was some speculation in the press, because of course there is, that she was the most powerful warship in the world. And a particular newspaper even went so far as to suggest that Vesuvius is just what the US Navy needs to deal with the Italian Navy, should Italy ever be so bold as to try and interfere with American politics. Yes, because clearly the uh, I Italian Atlantic fleet roaming up and down the East Coast was a very well-known problem in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Somewhat questionable headlines aside, Vesuvius did appear, on paper at least, to be very powerful, since, as we mentioned, she had three 15-inch guns on a hull that weighed less than a thousand tons in an era where battleships uh, carried only four 11 or 12-inch guns on hulls that outweighed her by a factor of 14 or 15 times. So, what was the big deal? Well, of course, it was the pneumatic dynamite guns, and enough teasing, let's go into them in a bit more detail. The reason that three apparently so heavy weapons could be fitted on such a small ship was because the guns themselves were very light. 
they were not the massive thick-walled cannon of the more conventional battleships. They were, as suggested by the name of the manufacturer, pneumatic weapons. Weirdly enough, although they were known as dynamite guns, dynamite was not involved in any way, shape or form in propelling the charges, nor really was it that much involved in the shells themselves. The shell's charge being mostly explosive gelatin, with a very small core of dynamite as an initiator. The propellant was in fact compressed air, as the other half of the pneumatic dynamite gun com company might suggest. Powerful air compressors below deck would pressurise specialised iron tanks, which would then be released with the simple pull of a lever. So indeed, instead of pulling a trigger to get these guns to fire, it would simply be a case of PULL THE LEVER! Also unlike conventional naval shells, the shells used in the pneumatic dynamite gun were not in fact made of steel, they were made of brass. And you might think, well brass is a relatively soft metal, surely that's terrible for armour piercing. And you'd be right, but these shells were not designed to punch through the sides of enemy ships and then explode inside, they were instead supposed to deliver the 600 pounds of explosive gelatin next to the enemy ship, and then the colossal shockwave created by the detonation of so much high explosive would punch the needed hole through the side of the enemy. The so-called torpedo shells were designed for use equally above and below the water at the time of impact, and tests of the shells at varying weights against wrought iron armour, which was still in use at the time, showed that the 600 pound charge designed for Vesuvius's guns could punch through a very respectable 16 inches of armour. There was some question about the accuracy of the guns, since, due to the fact the guns themselves were fixed, where the shells went was regulated entirely by how much air pressure you used to kick the shells out of the guns. However, trials against the rather wonderfully named schooner Silliman indicated that actually, at least in gun control conditions, the shells were relatively accurate, and of course, with such large charges, even one or two hits would prove devastating to most ships. With these promising results in hand, despite the shell charge weight having to be reduced to 500 pounds in practice, many possible uses were conceived for the new pneumatic gun. Although the compressed air only gave it a range of around about a mile, unless one of the smaller shells containing either 200 or only 50 pounds of explosive was used, the fact that they could be mounted in so small a ship led to suggestions of mounting a single such gun on a torpedo boat or perhaps a battery of such guns, or even a larger gun, on something like a torpedo ram. Since these ships were designed to get in close to the enemy anyway, and it was felt that perhaps being able to knock a massive hole in the enemy ship just before you had to launch your torpedoes, or indeed actually ram the thing, would probably disconcert the enemy to the point that they may not be able to effectively resist you. The three guns on Vesuvius were mounted in the bow, at a fixed elevation of 18 degrees, and ran pretty much all the way to the bottom of the ship. After commissioning, gunnery trials in the Hampton Roads generally went relatively well, but there was a significant amount of dissatisfaction expressed by the ship's captain and crew over the design of the ship itself, as opposed to the main armament. Unfortunately, during the time taken to build her and trial the guns, chemistry had moved on, and the slightly slower burning cordite and other charges that we mentioned at the beginning had begun to come into service, with these giving ship's guns a significantly greater range than the pneumatic gun, and being able to carry similar high explosive shells a much further distance, Vesuvius found itself very quickly technically obsolete. However, she did look very impressive, and so she spent a significant portion of the 1890s touring up and down as part of the North Atlantic Squadron, to the great delight of a great many visitors. However, as the decade and the century drew to a close, Vesuvius would have one last hurrah, as the Spanish-American War broke out, and the American Navy found it needed every ship it could possibly get, and so Vesuvius found itself operating off of Cuba. Someone had a bit of a brainwave and realised that, with pneumatic compressed air powering her guns, Vesuvius could fire at night without the telltale flash and roar of a shore bombardment, and thus she could become a stealth bombardment ship. In this role, the fact that her guns were incredibly short range didn't actually matter too much, since, of course, you couldn't shoot back at something that you couldn't see or hear. At the same time, as compared to conventional naval high explosive shells, 500 pounds of explosive gelatin created one heck of a bang, and a lot of craters. The 
only downside to this operation was that it turned out that, as compared to gunnery trials, in real life combat, estimating the exact range and then calibrating the gun's pneumatic air pressure to precisely that range, given that air temperature and therefore pressure would needed would vary considerably, depending on the operational environment, turned out to be a bit more of a complex science than anyone had bargained for, and the guns were fairly inaccurate. But the morale effect of sudden gargantuan explosions appearing all over the harbour was quite significant on the Spanish, especially since they had no idea where they were coming from. Nonetheless, with the war ended, it was fairly clear that the pre-dreadnought battleship was the way of the future, and Vesuvius didn't have much more of a future in the Navy in its current form. Instead, in 1904, she was converted into a torpedo testing vessel, and her main battery was removed, with various torpedo launchers installed. She would then spend the next 15 years testing various models of torpedo, and occasionally serving as a station ship, until 1921, when she was taken out of service, then decommissioned, and sold in 1922 for scrapping. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.